Monson. I'm the director of the African Studies Center here at MSU. And I'm also a professor in the history department. Mm -hmm. So I have two reasons to be delighted that uh, Didier Gondola is here today uh, to speak with us. He's a professor of African history and Africana studies at Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis, which is a mouthful. <laughs> He got his PhD in African history from the Université Paris 7, or Paris 7 University. His research focuses on popular culture, especially music, fashion, gambling, and memory. He looks at gender and post-colonial issues in Central Africa and the African diaspora in France. He was a Fulbright scholar in 2008 and 9, and he has done research and teaching activities at the University of Kinshasa in Congo. He's, he was a senior fellow at the Nantes Institute for Advanced Studies in France, a very prestigious center for international studies. And he's just finished a year-long research leave at the Collegium of Lyon, France, France, where he worked on a collaborative project related to the HIV in colonial Africa. Not only that, but uh, this very uh, multidisciplinary scholar is also preparing a biography of André Matswa Grenard, a political activist and visionary who campaigned for emancipation in France and the French Congo in the 1920s and the 1930s. He'll be talking to us today about his newly published book, Tropical Cowboys, Westerns, Violence, and Masculinity in Kinshasa, Congo. Welcome to MSU. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to all of you uh, who uh, took time off to come and uh, hear my talk. And I also would like uh, to thank uh, the organizers for their hospitality. I'd like to thank Nicole McKenzie and Liz Timms, and of course, uh, the director of the African Studies Center, uh, Jamie Monson. Uh, Ken uh, Harrow actually took uh, uh, um, came out of retirement to have breakfast with me this morning. <laughs> I really appreciated that. So thank you very much uh, to all the organizers. I'm very glad to be here. I'm planning to speak maybe for about 45 minutes, and then uh, I will be happy to entertain and to field some questions. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm talking to mostly uh, American students, faculty, and you guys, when you hear the name Buffalo Bill, uh, what probably comes to your mind is, I am sure, the American West, right? So you think about <coughs> Buffalo Bill, the icon, you think about Buffalo Bill, the legend. Uh, it's very interesting because Buffalo Bill is, in the legend of Buffalo Bill, he's really the one who, who kind of advanced the frontier out west. He's the one who advanced the manifest destiny out west. As a matter of fact, one of the very first people to uh, contribute to this iconization of Buffalo Bill was an American president by the name of uh, um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. In 1917, Roosevelt accepted the, vice pres the honorary vice pre presidency of the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association. And I would like just to read some of the things that he said in his acceptance speech, kind of eulogizing Buffalo Bill Cody. So he said, um, quote, that Buffalo Bill Cody was the most renowned of those men whose daring opened the West to settlement and civilization. American of Americans, Roosevelt continued, Cody embodied those traits of courage, strength, and self-reliant hardihood which are vital to the well-being of the nation, end quote. You know, and then there is also Buffalo Bill, the hunter, right? That's where he actually got his name from. And uh, it's really interesting that uh, what his admirers actually tend to kind of sweep under the rug of history is that Buffalo Bill lent his hand, not just his hand, but also his rifle to the slaughter of over 50 million bison that roamed the plains and kind of uh, uh, sustained Indian life and Indian culture. 
There is also Buffalo Bill, the entertainer, the showman, who took not just America, but also Europe by storm with, its, uh, with his Wild West and Congress of Rough Riders of the World. Buffalo Bill, for those of you who do not know that, he performed not just in America, but across the Atlantic to go to Europe. And he performed before dignitaries uh, for, uh, in London uh, for Queen Victoria. In Paris, he performed for a French president, Sadi Carnot, who was later on assassinated. And in Rome, he performed uh, for Pope Leo XIII and brought the West on stage to avid audiences with uh, Indian actors, you know, decked out in very showy costume. And this was very interesting because he did that at the same time when some Indians were fighting their very last battles on the mountains and on the plains and other Indians were being starved to death uh, on the reservations. And finally, and interestingly, there is also Buffalo Bill the Cowboy, right? Buffalo Bill the Cowboy. Um, he is credited to have single-handedly transformed the image of the cowboy from an outcast to a hero. And here there is an irony that I just really wanted to point to. Uh, the irony is that Buffalo Bill was even not himself a cowboy. He was not a cowboy. Uh, he was a scout. He was a, a buffalo hunter. He was a performer. And it was as a performer that he endowed the cowboy with a masculine mystique that Hollywood will later hijack, commodify, and circulate with uh, global success. Now, before I show you um, how Buffalo Bill arrived in Kinshasa in the early 1950s and captured the imagination of young people there and became a sort of eponymous hero to a large number of marginalized young people in Kinshasa, what I'd like to do is to survey the scene a little bit. And we have some students here that may actually not know much about the history of the Belgian Congo um, uh, prior to the arrival of Buffalo Bill uh, in Congo and especially in Kinshasa. So Kinshasa, Kinshasa was the capital of the Belgian Congo. But back then, it wasn't called Kinshasa, it was called Leopoldville. And the Belgian Congo was actually one of the most Orwellian and paternalistic colonies that Europeans had founded and had established in, in Africa. This was a, a colony that was extremely large, very large, as large as the United States of America east of the Mississippi River. So 80 times larger than tiny Belgium. And what's interesting is that until 1908, it wasn't actually officially a colony belonging to a European power. It was actually the personal private property of a monarch by the name of Leopold II. So it belonged to him. And what's interesting, and there's also an irony here, is that Leopold II never even set foot in Congo. He never went there, you know, but it was his private property from 1885 all the way to 1908 when he was actually forced to relinquish that and give it back to, uh, give it to, to Belgium. So under the guise of uh, spreading Christianity and civilization in the so-called heart of darkness, King Leopold II proceeded to establish a reign of terror in Congo. So villagers were uh, rounded up by his army. His army was called the Force Publique. And they were ordered to go deep inside the forest to collect wild rubber. And to force men to work, their wives and children were kept hostages until required quotas of rubber were delivered. Soldiers punished men who failed to provide the required quotas by raping their children, raping their wives and by cutting off their hands, sometimes their feet. So this was known as um, red rubber, and it claimed the lives of over 10 million Congolese people between 1885 and 1908. And if you're, very, if you're interested in the topic, as you probably know, some of, some of the people, faculty here, know about the Adam Hotchild's book, 
uh, King Leopold's The Ghost, I definitely um, suggest you read that if you want to find out more about uh, red rubber in, uh, in the Congo. So in 1908, as I was saying, uh, Belgium actually took over following the first international human rights campaign. And what's interesting is that this campaign, the very first international human rights campaign, was triggered by an African-American um, Presbyterian missionary who was based in Congo. His name is William Shepard. He's the one basically who started this international campaign. And the campaign was sustained by a London-based organization known as the Congo Reform Association. So as a result of this uh, colony that was a private property of a monarch becoming now an official colony of a European power, Belgium, what happened is that wanton violence uh, disappeared, but forced labor continued, and paternalism really became the hallmark of Belgian colonization in Congo. So this was a sort of a Hegelian notion that the African man was a big child, that colonization was the white man's burden. You are familiar with this expression. Uh, this was kind of the white man's God-given mission to rescue Africans from the clutches of savagery to domesticate their space, not just their space, but to domesticate also their, their mind, to domesticate their body. And it was believed that only under the uh, benevolent tutelage of European masters could African savages learn the rudiment of uh, Western uh, civilization. So uh, for the Belgians, uh, redeeming the savages could only take place in a European controlled environment where they could showcase all the goodies of Western civilization, technology, modernity, progress, Christianity, education, entertainment, and so forth. Cities really served as laboratories where this experiment could be carried out most effectively. So since Africans were essentialized by colonial ideology as big children, you can easily guess who would be entrusted to carry out the civilizing mission. White Catholic missionaries. They had something to teach, and that book is called the Bible, right? And so in addition to evangelizing, uh, they created and founded hospitals. They founded also schools. And in keeping with the kind of holistic ideology of mens sana in corpore sano, a sound spirit in a sound body, they also organized boy scouting and ran all sports activities in the Belgian colony. So there was yet another area where uh, Belgian Catholic missionaries salvific uh, intervention deployed, and that area is film making. Very quickly, uh, those Belgian missionaries uh, realized that uh, films could do a lot of good things for them. First of all, films easily appeal to Africans. The second thing is that with films, they could reach a wider, especially younger audience. The third thing is that they understood that films could spread the educational schemes that had until then been confined to uh, or limited to religious school and training programs. So I want to talk very briefly about the two kinds of film ventures that those Belgian Catholic missionaries promoted in Congo starting in the 1940s and then 1950s. The first um, uh, film venture was the homegrown missionary film production in Congo. So in the late 1940s, uh, those missionary filmmakers, they produced a slew of short documentaries that were predicated on the big child premise that I mentioned earlier. And those documentaries really subjected Africans um, to vexing sermonizing. Uh, Let's take the first of them. 
the first one on the list. It's called Leur, all right? So this is the documentary that was produced to teach them punctuality, all right? Mm -hmm. The second one is l'utilité de la couverture, okay? How the blanket can be useful. So you need to use the blanket. So they, 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 they had to produce a 35, 37 minute long <laughs> documentary to teach people how to use a blanket. La propreté du corps, cleanliness of the body. La brouette is very interesting. Do you know the, the translation in, in English, la brouette? The wheelbarrow. So there was a documentary <laughs> dedicated to teach them how to use the wheelbarrow. So um, you can easily understand that those documentaries were perceived by the African audiences as being extremely demeaning, right? And uh, very gradually, the urban audiences, especially in Kinshasa, just boycotted those movies. They just didn't want to see the movies anymore. So the missionaries had to go show those movies to remote villages because in Kinshasa, nobody wanted to see those movies anymore. And the missionaries also uh, tried their hand on a Congolese version of Laurel and Hardy um, that was called Matamata Epidipidi with quite a bit of slapstick humor, as you can uh, expect. But here, the purpose was the same. The purpose was not just to, to, to entertain the African audience, but it was also to instill morals and values and all that. So that was the first venture. Now, the second venture was American movies, especially Charlie Chaplin's silent comic shows and Tarzan movies. The missionaries thought that, and they were right, that those two movies, those two genres, Charlie, Charlie Chaplin and, and Tarzan's movies, could very easily clear the very strict Belgian colonial censorship commission. And they did. Now, Chaplin's silent movies were deemed innocuous and, and certainly had a strong entertainment value to them. Missionary also thought that Tarzan's movies could appeal to the African audience uh, because they took place in the jungle, right? You know, Africans came from the jungle. They contained lots of animals, so Africans are gonna love it, you know, to see the wild animals. And um, the plot of those Tarzan movies was fairly simple. Okay, so they were thinking that, okay, those African audiences would be able to grasp those plots, you know, very, very easily. Then in the early, um, in the early 1950s, Buffalo Bill came to Congo, especially to Kinshasa. Now, there's a reason why the Catholic missionaries brought Buffalo Bill movies to African audiences. First, something that you need to know is that reenactments re of Buffalo Bill Wild West shows remained extremely popular in Europe in the 1950s, 1960s, and 70s until today. I mean, Buffalo Bill is a very emblematic figure all over Europe. In Congo, in the 1950s, European residents attended elaborate Buffalo Bill Wild West shows with horses, bonfires, a replica of a saloon, and performers in full cowboy gear. There is also, I think, a plausible reason why Belgian Catholic missionaries became enamored with Buffalo Bill. He reminded them so much of their King Leopold II, the founder of the Congo. What's interesting is that Buffalo Bill, Cody, and Leopold II actually met once in London on June the 20th, 1887, at the Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. So only once, but they knew of each other's work. So in the eyes of the Belgian Catholic missionaries, 
the two men may have had more in common than just their resplendent beards and august demeanors. <laughs> Missionaries view them consciously or unconsciously, and that's an argument that I'm making in my book, as kindred spirits who had simultaneously tamed the wild and advanced Western civilization in Terra Nullius. So Leopold II did that in the so-called Heart of Darkness, and Buffalo Bill achieved and accomplished that in the American Wild West. The globalization of Western movies in the 1950s presented the missionaries with a great opportunity to introduce Buffalo Bill to the African youth audience. And there is one single movie that did it, and that movie is called Pony Express. It starred uh, Charlton Heston as Buffalo Bill. So Pony Express was released in American theaters in 1953. The following year, it was dubbed in French under the name of Le Triomphe de Buffalo Bill. And then it found its way in Kinshasa late 1954, early 1955. So Pony Express did not arrive alone in Kinshasa. It arrived along with another movie that's called The Lone Ranger. You know, every time I would ask my informants about movies that they were watching, movies that kind of shaped their culture, their movement, invariably they would always tell me The Lone Ranger. So, The Lone Ranger was translated into French as Les Justiciers du Far West. That's the name of it. So, Initially, when the film came out in 1938, the actor, the main actor, was a guy by the name of Lee Powell. And then when it became a TV series, it was Clinton Moore from 1949 to 1957. What you may not know is that originally, The Lone Ranger was a radio show. And it appeared for the very first time in 1933, not as a film, but as a radio show. And something that you probably don't know is that the hero in The Lone Ranger was actually inspired by an African-American U.S. deputy marshal by the name of Bass Reeves. And Bass Reeves was very active in Arkansas and in the Oklahoma Territory. So The Lone Ranger was inspired by a black person. So uh, here's how Kinshasa's youth watch those Western movies, according to one of my informants. And I'm quoting him here. As soon as projection starts, the crowd gets spun into a frenzy. At the first apparition of the cowboy, a deluge of applauses and an explosion of deafening voices and whistles fill the room. The film dialogues are drowned out by the screams of vociferous spectators standing on their feet, asking for more violent action. Some climb on top of their seats, clench their fists, and lash out at imaginary opponents. And young people would come back to watch the same movie over and over. And the fourth time, they would serve as self-appointed commentators and spoilers. <laughs> so I argue in my work that this performativity of African audiences actually reflected local ways of engaging with motions that contrasted with audience reception in Europe and America. And instead of viewing it as disorderly comportment and cinematic illiteracy, I propose to view it as appropriation and attempts by these African audiences to create a cinematic culture of their own. So young viewers in Kinshasa's townships, they parlayed their vision of the American West from the screen to the street, creating in the process a very unique hybrid blend that conflated the Hollywood version of the drifting cowboy with local elements of manhood. They fashioned 
township gangs after frontier posses. They dub themselves Bills after their hero, Buffalo Bill. What's interesting is that that term Bill would be used interchangeably with the term Yankee. Each township in Kinshasa had its own gang of bills that policed the neighborhood, prevented other gangs from encroaching on their township, deterred young children from skipping school and girls from wandering outside of their neighborhood. They also adopted nicknames from the repertoire of Westerns and other movies, and they fought fiercely over those nicknames. In my research, very interesting, I have come across only one, one Indian name, Apache. And it's not even the name of an Indian, it's the name of an Indian tribe. Bills, and maybe you're gonna be surprised to hear that, Bills who were persecuted, they were stigmatized, they were oppressed by the colonizers, they rooted for the cowboys. They didn't root for the Indians. And they didn't identify themselves with the Indians, but rather with the cowboys. In this regard, I think, these young moviegoers conformed to what Hollywood Westerns attempted to convey. They related to Indians with little sympathy just as Hollywood expected of viewers, Indians were the losers, Indians were the zeros, cowboys were the winners, they were the heroes. Now, to be a cowboy, or to be a Yankee, or to be a Bill, a tough guy, because that's what it really means, it means to be a tough guy, in Kinshasa, one had to engage in several performative rituals. The first one is called kintulu, and kintulu comes from a Kikongo term, tolo, and tolo means this part of the body. So kintulu basically means bodybuilding. And kintulu figured prominently as a badge of masculinity in 1950s Kinshasa, especially as it intersected notions of courtship, seduction, and sex appeal. So young Bills, not all of them, not all of them engaged in Kintulu. Some, only some, and those who engaged in Kintulu were known as Apollos and could be seen flexing their overinflated bodies at their usual hangout, sometimes drawing huge crowds of onlookers. So, since so much of their gang activities revolved around fighting, gang fighting, actually, gang fighting was called in their language, in their argo, it was called billing. Okay? Billing is gang fighting. They would fight over turfs, townships. As I said, if one gang, Gang A, is trying to encroach in Gang B territory, that was cause for a billing. They would fight over girls. They would fight over nicknames, too. So because of that, Bills did not just rely on bodybuilding and martial arts, but also on magical rituals known as Kamu, all right? So, if you are a Bill, you want to be strong, right? You go to a Grand Bill, and a Grand Bill gonna subject you to a ritual that will give you the strength, the power that you need against your opponents. So this is called Kamo, and Kamo involved actually two rituals that are just two procedures, very distinct pr procedures that I want to talk about very briefly. First, that grand bill gonna cut you, minor incisions on some key parts of your body, your wrist, your temples, your feet, right? So the blood gonna, you know, bloodletting. 
So after that procedure is done, so that's called nzoloko. Those are the minor incisions. Then de depending on who cut the camo or the type of strength that you were seeking, a particular mixture of burned powder known as nkisi, containing animal skin, bones, claws, teeth, would be applied to the open wound. Okay, so you have the nzoloko first, and then nkisi is applied to the nzoloko to give you the strength that you need. Kamo is something that really fascinated me because it was thought by the bills to shield and sanctuarize their bodies. After listening in disbelief to informants telling me that their Kamo stories, so many Kamo stories that I heard, people chewing and swallowing broken bottles, razor blades, people entering in a sta state of trance, people head-butting trees, and walls. When I heard those stories, I heard a story of even somebody who swallowed needles to be strong, 12 needles. He said, now the guy is like in his 70s, he said he doesn't know where those needles ended up in his body. But he had to swallow them because the grand bill who cut Camo told him, if you really want to be strong, bring me some needles and I will show you how to swallow them and to be strong. So after listening to all of those camo stories, I was compelled to look at manhood as an ongoing construct fraught with tensions between self-preservation and self-destruction, or self, the self-preservation of the body or self-destruction of the body. <laughs> now, to be admitted uh, into any formal or informal gang of bills, one had to smoke marijuana. So when I asked one of my informants, uh, who actually became a ambassador, Congo's ambassador to the UN, but when he was young, he was a bill in his neighborhood. So we were talking about marijuana, and I asked him uh, why in the township the Grand Bills forced him to smoke his first joint. So this is what he said. He said that. Uh, they resented his intellectual heirs and wanted him to be like them. The focal point of the movement, he added, was marijuana. The true bill was in marijuana. That's what he said. So marijuana was not just an illegal yet a readily available substance that served to bond bands of bills. It served the same purpose as Camus as it allowed these young people to dull the pain of dereliction at, at the bottom rung of the broken colonial urban ladder. But bills were not just at the receiving end of colonial violence, they inflicted violence themselves too, especially gender violence. So Western films that those young people were watching in Kinshasa in the 1950s were replete with what I call rape scripts. And because Hollywood intended them to be a version of outdoor action story rather than a version of romance, Westerns had to present the cowboy as inclined to die rather than to marry. Of course, the Bills grew familiar with the recurring plot-based narrative of most of those films in which females appear only as hapless, clumsy character to be rescued by heroic men. Add to that that in 1950s Kinshasa, the male population largely outnumbered the female population. And because of that, girls were really thought to be some kind of trophies in gang fighting. So some gangs would make incursion into another gang's territory with the sole purpose of abducting a few girls from that township, from that neighborhood, and taking them back to their hangouts to have sex with them. That was the purpose, sometimes. And a gang felt particularly humiliated, not because it suffered a defeat in a billing, a gang fight, but because 
two or three of their township girls were corralled away and violated by a rival gang. So this was really worse than being trounced because it, it, it exposed the gang's inability to protect their girls, thus calling into question their masculinity. Because if you are not able to protect your girls, you are no man. And, you know, if you have more questions, you have questions about that, I'll be happy to, to respond uh, during the Q&A session. Now, because obviously, you know, as you can see, some of those activities were deviant and were criminalized by colonial authorities, the bills had to develop their own language. So their language was known as Indubil. And they did that because they wanted and they were determined to conceal some of their activities from the adults and from the authorities because a few of them actually were put in prison by the colonial authorities. They were arrested and put in prison. When I looked at the vocabulary of Indubil, what I found out is that 50% of the Indubil vocabulary dealt actually with two activities, drug consumption and girls. 50% of the vocabulary. All the terms that you are seeing on the slide were ecumenical, meaning that they were used by all the gangs in Kinshasa in the 1950s and 60s, regardless of the township in which they lived. But I also discovered that there were some terms that were extremely parochial, meaning that they circulated only within a close-knit township and not beyond, All right? Again, if you have questions, uh, I'll be more than happy to answer about this particular slide. Now, I want to move to the end of the movement and uh, conclude my talk. Uh, the end of the bill movement came about as a result of two developments that occurred around the end of the colonial period in the Belgian Congo. We are talking about the late 1950s and early 1960s. The first development is the ministry of a maverick Belgian missionary by the name of Joseph Dalat. He came to Congo in 1955, I believe, 1955, 1956. He was fairly young. He came from Belgium. What's interesting about him is that he came from a Belgian order that was really kind of embedded within the local population. So even before he set foot in Kinshasa, he could already speak Lingala. So Lingala is kind of the vernacular, is the lingua franca in Kinshasa and in the larger part of the, the country. So the first thing that he did was to befriend several Grand Bills. He learned very quickly how to speak Indubil. At some point, Joseph Dalat was even preaching the gospel in Indubil. Not just in Lingala, but he was preaching the gospel in Indubil. When, when I met with him in 2006, he told me that he was even musing about translating the Bible into Indubil. He even smoked marijuana. So now there are two versions of that. Don't think about marijuana now, right? Think about marijuana back in the 1950s, you know, when it was totally an illegal substance. So in the 1969 interview that he gave, he said, yes, I did smoke marijuana because I wanted to fit in. This was the only way for me to fit in, to be embedded within the, organ the movement, you know, to kind of gain their trust. I had to smoke marijuana, 1969. So I spoke with him in 2006, and I just wanted to confirm that because I had read that in the 1969 article. He said, no, I never smoked marijuana. He said, yeah, I was a pipe smoker, and then they stuffed some marijuana in my pipe, and I did not inhale because I knew it was marijuana. <laughs> That's what he said in 2006. <laughs> so very gradually, he attracted the bills to a youth center that he set up 
in his parish at, in the heart of Kinshasa's tropical west. The center had a bakery, it had a restaurant. He allowed young people to play the guitar, to smoke marijuana. Um, he also trained them in different trades. He endeared himself to the bill so much so that they nicknamed him Père Buffalo, Father Buffalo. He also, and this is really interesting for me, was very interesting for me as a researcher, he also provided the bills with an outlet to express themselves. He created a makeshift magazine known as Esprit de la Jeunesse, Spirit of Youth. Um, that widely circulated in Kinshasa and contributed to the standardization of Indubil. So you can imagine that this was one of my main sources of information to do this research and write this book. So this was the first development that kind of precipitated the ending of this movement, late 1950s, early 1960s. The second one is President Mobutu ascended to power in 1965 as a result of a military coup. He knew very well that in order to secure his, oh, in order to secure his grip on Kinshasa, the capital city, and the whole country, he needed the support of the young people in Kinshasa. The only way to reach them was through the grand bills because those grand bills basically held sway in Kinshasa's townships. They were the street elite. They controlled everything in those different townships. And Mobutu knew that if I want to assert my power, to establish my power, to secure the grip that I had, the very tenuous grip, grip that I have on this new country, I had to make peace with the young people. I had to seek their loyalty. So he used the Grand Bill to penetrate that milieu of young people in Kinshasa. How did he do that? He did that by co-opting some of those Grand Bills into his new regime, right? Uh, so that actually dealt a blow to the Bill movement. Uh, Clockwise, starting from the, from here, this guy, his name is Jose Patrick Nimi Maidika. He was a Bill that I interviewed in his youth. He ended up being Mobutu's closest advisor. He was a senior advisor to Mobutu. Um, Paul Kabaidi. Paul Kabaidi was very, a key figure in the Bill movement in the 1950s. He actually, Mobutu approached him to recruit the bills into the youth um, branch or the youth wing of Mobutu's political party. So Kabaidi served that role of uh, recruiting the bills into Mobutu's youth party. He later on became the governor of the city of Kinshasa because in Kinshasa there's a governor, there's not a mayor. There's no mayor in Kinshasa, but the governor because it's so wide and so big. I interviewed him too. Uh, Jean-Jacques Kande um, Jambulata was Mobutu's minister of information. He was also a young Bill. Uh, he was very renowned for his camo because he caught a lot of camos. He was extremely strong. People really feared him. And next to him, the very last person, I mentioned him. Uh, he's the one who said that they had forced him to smoke his first marijuana joint. His name is Igor Bomin Ansomi. He was also part of Mobutu's political party, and he was Mobutu's last ambassador to the UN in, uh, I think, 1996, 1997. So I'd like to uh, end this presentation with a standard question that I used to ask my informants. Uh, how do Congolese remember the bills today? I was all, always interested in knowing, in making a connection between the bills and then some of their avatars, some 
youth movements that came later on. And I really wanted my informants to make that link, to make the comparison, to make the connection. And I asked that question to one of my informants, and this is what he replied. He said, uh, we don't remember them. They are still around with us. Thank you. <laughs> I'd be happy to feel some, uh, oh, go ahead, go yeah, ahead, yeah. Jane. The, no, no. Well, thank you so much, first of all, for really interesting, stimulating, and, and entertaining thank you. <laughs> presentation. And we do have time for question and answers, and we ask those out that, that ask questions to please use the microphone. It's not for amplification, but so that we can get the questions on the live stream for those that aren't in the room with us. So, uh, Shingi, would you like to pass the mic? And Usually we take two or three uh, at a time. Okay, sure. Okay. <laughs> so we've got two here, yeah. Take two or three at a time. So thank you so much for a really fascinating mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. I've long been a fan of your work. And thank you very I have, much. We have lots of things to talk about, so we can talk for after the talk. Okay. I don't want to totally sure. monopolize because I have lots of questions. Okay. But um, maybe if you could elaborate a little bit, I know you go into a lot more depth on the things that you talked about today in the book. But could you talk a little bit or elaborate a little bit more on some of the sort of indigenous cultural forms that you see influencing how people responded in the theaters to films? Mm -hmm. So you talk about the fact that, you know, African forms of reception aren't these passive things where you sit quietly in your seat, yeah, but you yeah, interact yeah. With, with what's going on. So I'd just like to hear you elaborate a little bit on what you see as, yeah, some of the reasons that influence um, that form of reception. And then another question that I have, it's been a while since I read the book, so I'm, I don't really remember, but I, I, I vaguely remember, and I could be wrong, that in Kinshasa, Africans were not allowed in the theaters themselves, that a lot of the viewing actually took place like in churches and stuff until much later. And so I'm, I'm curious about the theaters and access to theaters and this territoriality in terms of the bills. Were there that many theaters or did these gangs come together at the theaters? Mm -hmm. Like were there one or two theaters maybe that people mm -hmm. could get into? Mm -hmm. And then what transpired when you have several different gangs coming together mm -hmm. at a theater? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is uh, about the influence of American culture in the Belgian Congo but by that time, because obviously your research is focused on the Buffalo Bill the topic, and you mentioned specifically two films. But I wonder, and I, I also has relation with the question of Laura, if there was by that time, who, who distributed the films? And in fact, we know that, that the Western, uh, how can I say, phenomenon is, is, is very wide by the time in the world. I mean, the Western uh, movies, not only Buffalo Bill, are very uh, important uh, contribution of American culture to the world. We must remember the, the spaghetti and uh, uh, Western, no? that Ital Italians made a lot of Westerns. In many other countries, they make Westerns. I think even in India, they, they, they produce some. So in that sense, I would like to know more about uh, the availability of the westerns because I, i'm not sure if only two movies will make uh, complete fashions yeah also the american influence of culture by that time understand that probably being belgian congo uh, a, a colony with more french influence i would like to know if there's more i mean if not only film but music or another element mm -hmm are around this conception of the Buffalo Bill. Mm -hmm. Because uh, even in, uh, in Kenya and in Tanzania, in certain moments, the, the twist was a very, a very important uh, musical kind of uh, uh, approach or influence of, of American. Mm -hmm. And finally, I would like to know more about the, the use of uh, uh, marijuana with these people. <laughs> Don't ask me. Because, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I mean, not that, uh, that uh, in that sense. But because in other movements, even the Rastafaris, uh, make the use of marijuana not only, uh, how can I say, the way of, of, of boasting, 
but it has a religious or a psychological, uh, in, uh, I, I mean, uh, motive. Okay, that will be my question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any one more? Yeah, was there one more? Yeah, I'll take it. I have nine questions. Oh, no, just great. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I love the photographs in the book, many of the best ones you put up on the screen. Uh, some of them you took of the old men that you interviewed, and many of them were Jean de Barras photographs. Absolutely. So my question for you is, can you tell us more about the photographs themselves that Debara took and the man who took them? Uh, because I think these sources really complement your oral interviews uh, in an interesting way. Um, so I'd love to hear your reflections on that. So that was a summary of your nine questions? <laughs> Fortunately, we, we, can, we can talk about the other ones in the podcast. <laughs> okay, starting with Laura's uh, uh, question. Um, you you asking me about some indigenous cultural forms of responding to film. You know, I think that popular culture in Kinshasa and, and Congo in general is always participatory. I mean, people are not on the side uh, when you have performers actually performing in the middle on the scene. People participate. People respond by actually becoming participant in the uh, performance that's taking place. So I think that what those young people did was basically to just parlay those indigenous forms of engaging with performance into the movie theater, they didn't really see a separation, a disconnect between them as spectators and the movie, you know, that was on the screen. They, they saw themselves as also being part of the action, if you will. Um, uh, so so it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't really the, the dialogues actually were not, were not, um, what was important. What was important was the movement, was the motion, and those are young people, and they could relate to that, they could participate in, in that sense. Um, uh, those theaters, um, you have to understand that a lot of the movies were actually, um, would go through the uh, censorship commission, and then some of the violent scenes, you know, would be removed. And some of the distributor, the distributors of the movies would always kind of uh, try to bargain with the colonial commission, censorship commission, to see if uh, you know they would cut as less as possible because they wanted to show their movies. Because keep in mind that they were showing the movies to the European audience, uncensored movies, and then to the African audience. So the the producer, the the distributors were they, they really wanted to to keep the integrity of those, those movies as much as possible. But later on in the late 1950s, uh, you had makeshift theaters all over Kinshasa, and those young people had no need of those missionaries anymore. Okay, so they, so, you know, a, a, anybody could, anybody who had connections, you know, would start a movie theater, very informal, very makeshift, you know, and then uh, project those movies for the young, uh, to the young audience. I think that those, uh, uh, especially initially when uh, they were showing the movies, the Catholic missionaries were showing the movies in, in big, you know, large uh, movie theaters, uh, it was a time for all members of different gangs to kind of bury the hash, hatchet. You know, this was a time where you don't come here to fight. You, you come here to perform, you come here to watch movies, you come here to entertain yourself. Fighting is actually in the streets, you know, not in the movie theater. I haven't come across billings, gang fights, you know, inside the movie theater. And especially because of the fact that they were, they were a, a space that was controlled in the sense that uh, the Belgians really were careful that the violence didn't got out of hand. That was, you know, p p people were screaming and so on, but it wasn't really physical violence because the Belgians were always making sure to avoid that. 
Uh, who distributed the films? Your question, private distributors. They had connections in France and in Belgium because those movies came actually from France and from Belgium. And um, they wanted to make profit. So they were always negotiating with the Belgian authorities to make sure that, because if you, you, you bring a movie from France or, and the movie is censored, you know, you lose your money. So they were always negotiating, and they wanted to also to make sure that the movie had wide circulation within the colony, so they could actually make profit. Starting in Kinshasa, they would end up in Elizabethville, which is now Lumbumbashi, or to show the movie to a wider audience. But what's interesting is that the Bill movement really picked up only in Kinshasa. In Lubumbashi, for example, Elizabethville or other cities in, in Congo, I have not, um, I have not, in my research, noticed any movement similar to the bills in Kinshasa. American culture, um, you know that in 1942, um, some American servicemen, actually, I think 1,500 of them, came to Kinshasa. This was part of uh, Roosevelt's uh, way of uh, using Kinshasa as a, as a place to, to ferry weapons to North Africa in 1942. And they, 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 they stayed there for a few months. And they really kind of uh, um, were in interaction with the people, the local people in Kinshasa, especially the young people. My assumption, the assumption that I'm making in my work, is that the term Yankee probably originated back then in 1942. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was a lot of admiration of those American servicemen when they stationed in Kinshasa in 1942. As far as music is concerned, the source of influence that really tremendously shaped Congolese music is really not American music per se, maybe later on. But in the 1950s, it was high life mm -hmm. coming from uh, Nigeria and West Africa, Afro-Cuban rumba and things like that. Mm -hmm. But not really, although if you look at the, the names of Congolese bands in the 1950s, you would see the name jazz, like OK Jazz, African Jazz, and so on. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they were influenced by jazz, because the kind of music they play is definitely not jazz. It's rumba, you know? It's rumba, yeah. So later on, yeah, definitely American influence in terms of music, but not in the period that I'm concerned with. Jean de Parra, very fascinating person. He was Bill himself. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was repairing shoes, I guess, initially. He was not even the photographer. And then somebody gave him a, a, uh, a camera, and he started to photograph. And um, he was really kind of a, you know, you would call him an embedded photographer. He was really embedded within the local population. And he was doing things that were pretty subversive, you know? So uh, some of the pictures, for example, many of the pictures that he took are pictures of uh, Les Femmes Libres of Kinshasa, those free women of Kinshasa. And uh, he's, he also has a lot of pictures of uh, biracial, I mean, mixed couples, I mean, you know, um, in Kinshasa in the 1950s. Um, this was extremely subversive. So pictures of the nightlife in Kinshasa at the, in, in the late 1950s. Um, um, so as I said, transgressive pictures. He, also, he was also the photographer. Um, um, he was hired by Franco. Uh, Franco is kind of the, the, the father of Congolese music, hired him to be his per, per, uh, uh, personal photographer. Um, very much interested in the Bill culture. Very, very much interested in that culture. And, and with the, without him, we wouldn't really have an idea of how, for example, the Bills were dressed up and how they looked, you know. So his, his oeuvre, his work is really essential. Just like I mentioned the Esprit de la Jeunesse, you know, that uh, uh, magazine that Père Buffalo created. 
th those were really two very important sources for me to, uh, to do my work. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, as a matter of fact, there's a, there's a kind of a group in France that's called the uh, Revue Noire, and uh, they are currently working on a biography of, uh, of Jean de Parra. Yeah. So it's going to be a bilingual edition, French and English. Uh, it's, it's, it's called Revue Noire because they have the right to most of the pictures mm. of, of the part. Mm. 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 Dave? If we um, fast forward to the present, okay. the last 20, 25 years, and we look at film and more specifically the urban jungle films of America, um, African-American films. Um, how does that play in um, Kasasha or anywhere else? So specifically, I'm comparatively thinking of South Africa and how South African culture, as you just described, is quite, is, is quite similar in the, in, the, in the 90s up to the present with um, incorporating some of those kind of images from films and, and specific, specifically from the, the urban jungle films of, um, of, of America. Okay. So what, what films do you have in mind? Like Boys in the Hood. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thank you for a really fascinating and um, approachable talk, I will say. You provided a lot of really important information that was easy to follow. Um, so my question, you, you mentioned how President Mamutu co-opted this, the, the, the bills into the government. How did the previous governments look at the bills? This seems like, especially in the Belgian period, something that the, the Belgian government would have been very concerned about. Um, so I was just wondering how they, um, did they take any sort of stance towards the bills? Did they try to interfere with bill activity or anything like that? Mm. Um, so I was really struck when you were um, showing the indubile, some of the the language that was used, and also some of the names of the gangs that Godzilla was really prominent as well. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about kind of the influence of Godzilla and how it came to be shown in the Congo. <laughs> okay. So, uh, David? Eric. Eric? Yes. Eric, um, I, I don't know, uh, I'm trying to see if I understood your question. Um, I think that the, the Western genre, um, the, the Hollywood, Hollywood Western genre was very important in, in Kinshasa uh, because after the 1950s Western movies, um, there was also what we call the spaghetti westerns, were extremely popular in the 1970s, like films such as you know the the, the uh, Clint Eastwood trilogy is very popular in Kinshasa. But the urban jungle movies um, in the 1990s, I haven't really looked at that because that's really not the the period that I'm concerned with in my book. Um, and I haven't certainly seen that urban jungle genre give rise to a specific culture, uh, a specific movement in Kinshasa, in Congo, as it probably did in a place like South Africa with the Tsotsi. Um, I don't know if there's a link between that urban jungle movie genre and the Tsotsi in, in, uh, in South Africa, but certainly not in Kinshasa. Um, yeah, so Mobutu did co-opt, yeah, because this was his strategy. Um, because, uh, you know, in so many regimes in Africa, one of the goals was actually to brainwash the young people. So you need to have access to them, to reach out to them. So the grand bills such as uh, Paul Kabaidi were extremely instrumental. Before Mobutu, we talk about basically colonization. The bills are criminalized. But it, 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 it's very ambiguous, you know, because 
in the townships, the bills are in, in, I have a chapter in my book that's called Predators and Protectors. Because it, it, it's a, the bill is a Janice-faced figure. Um, parents in the township, they liked the bills because the bills were disciplining the children. They would always, they were not going to school, the grand bills, you know, but they would always make sure that the kids go to school. They had more authority over the children of the neighborhood than their own parents. So the parents felt kind of indebted to the bills because of this avancular role that they had. But because of all of those sordid stories, you know, rape and things like that, smoking marijuana, debauchery, and so on. So it was really ambivalent. But definitely, uh, from the perspective of the colonial authorities, those young people were not only deviant, but they were also bordering crime. A few of them, as I said uh, in my talk, were actually apprehended. They were, they were sent to juvenile detention centers, especially one in Madimba in the Bakongo area, one of the bills stayed there basically until independence in 1960. It's only because independence intervened that he was released from prison. So he was there from maybe five years from 1955 or 1960, 56 to 1960. So I wouldn't say that Mobutu rehabilitated the bills. What he did to, was to end the movement, to co-opt them, yeah, to basically use them because he... He, he sensed that this movement could be a threat to his um, newly found power. Godzilla Liz, <laughs> <laughs> tough question. <laughs> I don't know how to respond. Uh, I just really don't want to give you the impression that those young people were watching solely Western movies. They were watching uh, lots of different movies. And if you just look at the names, the, like Zorro, you have the name Zorro. You have uh, so many different names because they were watching a lot of genres, you know. But the Western genre was the most popular, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the one that really kind of shaped their movement. Um, but I'm very sure that at some point, you know, Godzilla came to Kinshasa just like Buffalo Bill. And uh, one of the bills, you know, was like, oh, I need to name. But, but Godzilla was, and, and at some point, Godzilla was not just the, a, a, um, a nickname. It was also a, in, in part of their vocabulary to say somebody that's strong, right? Somebody that's strong. So, uh, <laughs> so. I hope that's a little helpful. Um, yeah, thank you so much mm -hmm. for your talk. Um, I have a question um, from looking at the photographs of kind of the clothing that they wear um, and the like, the guns that they have and their holsters on their hips, um, and then also thinking about um, their activities like s smoking marijuana and being in gangs. I kind of was wondering about the economic aspect of the bills and like how that subculture might have also sustained an economy and I wonder if if you would characterize it in that way sustain the the economy yeah and maybe not the economy of Kinshasa but their own internal economy or um, informal economy to sustain that I think um, they had some illicit ways of um, getting money or getting getting some of those items <coughs> One of the things that the Grand Bills would do is, is, is it called racket, racketeering? Racketeering, right? Mm -hmm. To ask the young people, you know, go get me five francs. Find a way to get me five francs. I, I don't know, I, I don't care how you're going to get that money, but go get me that money. And those young people were so afraid. They would go and go home and, you know, steal money from their parents and bring it back to the, to the, to the bills. Because as a young person, you, you fear them. You didn't respect them, but you definitely fear them. And you also wanted to be protected by them. 
okay? So you would basically do that. That's how they got the resources to buy those clothes and, and, and so on. You know, some of them told me that they had um, strategies that I, I read that in uh, Malcolm X's autobiography. You know, they would go into a store at closing and then basically uh, two or three men, two or three of them would be inside at night. The, 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 the store is closed and then they had large bags and they stuffed the bags with different things and then they sleep in the store until the opening in, in the morning and in the morning their accomplices come and they distract you know as the, the shop is opening they distract the shopkeeper and then they are able to escape with the with the, what they looted so yeah so that's how basically they were able to afford those um those clothes and so on. Yeah, thank you for the talk. <laughs> I really enjoy it. Thank so, you. you mentioned that uh, American movies, particularly Hollywood, seems to have more profound impact on the guns and other things you discuss in the talk compared to the Indian and. It appears in other part of Africa, Indian movies seems to, uh, people seem to buy into Indian movie, especially questions of marriage, ideas, relationship, yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. Do you observe some kind of things like that? Do you see any other impact beyond guns and all these things that comes from other genre of m movies different from the, uh, the Hollywood ones? I think that, um Indian movie in Kinshasa was a fad. It didn't really last long. Uh, it was definitely after the bills, you know. But more recently, you know, by recently I mean probably the 1990s, we have Nollywood movies that are extremely, extremely popular in Kinshasa's living rooms. And I think that uh, those Nollywood movies are really attracting uh, um, people in Kinshasa because of kind of the underpinning uh, religious or you know there's always a battle in those movies between good and evil you know and things like that and that's so appealing for people in Kinshasa you know who are also you know battling evil and things like that evil coming from the government from their the authorities and so on so the 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 Nollywood movies in Kinshasa are extremely, extremely appealing. Yeah, more so than those Indian movies of, uh, those Bollywood movies of, uh, what, the 1980s maybe, uh, 19, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would say that. But I, I think it's kind of the religious, um, the religious narrative. You know, there's a very interesting narrative, a narrative sometimes of redemption, you know, somebody that's, uh, there's a spell on somebody or th things like that. Kinshasa, people in Kinshasa find them to be really entertaining, to be kind of, it, they resonate with uh, some of the challenges and things that they are going through. I know your focus is on this kind of masculine culture, and it sounds like the film space was a space for young men. Uh, was there any parallel culture among girls? Uh, we know in, in Dar es Salaam they were wearing mini skirts and scandalizing their parents, and were girls responding to any similar kind of popular culture at the time? Oh, that's a, that's a beautiful question. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you're looking at, at young men, but wondering if, if there's anything on Well, that. you know, if, if you look at the cover of the book, there are actually two girls. Mm -hmm. Did you notice? I didn't notice. Yeah. So I met this one here. So this picture was taken probably 1950. I want to say 1958, 57, 58. So this young girl, she's now in her 80s now, I guess. His name is Therese Muyaka. So I met with her, uh, interviewed her many times. Um, she, she, she hasn't lost her seductive power. She's just, she's, she's really amazing, you know. She was kind of, uh, 
I don't want to say more. <laughs> she wanted to flirt with me. I mean, I, it was very interesting. Very, she, she's so sweet, so sweet. She was, um, she had seven children from seven different men, not husbands, never got married. She was a bill, but she was a biless because they were cowgirls as well. Okay, and then there's actually one particular gang that started this movement, but quite late, and it didn't really have time to kind of take shape and become popular among girls. So she definitely was a cowgirl. What's interesting is that she was a, she had to comport herself and to behave as she was aspiring to this same kind of masculinity. You know, it's it's. You couldn't be a cowgirl and be a girl. You had to be like a man because I was asking her, for example, they would um, commandeer a um, nightclub, the Bills. Commandeer the nightclub and then nobody could come in, nobody could get out of the nightclub. And they would just sit there and get some food for free, food and drinks for free, and then they would force the patrons to dance with them and so what's interesting is that I was asking her, so you were a girl or a, a boy, so who did you dance with? Did you dance with girls or would you, did you dance with men? She said, of course, no, I danced with girls because I was, a, I was a bill. I couldn't dance with boys. So that was really interesting. She didn't dance with men, but she did dance with with girls, with, with, with uh, women, just like the other members of her gang. So, um, so yeah, so in my work, I show how m girls, more or less, were really on the periphery of the movement. But at some point, because of this specific gang in Kinshasa, some girls were also got closer to the core, to the heart of the movement, and they really started to adopt, you know, some of the rituals and so on. Like, for example, Teresh cut camo. Right? She, yeah, she cut camo. She told me. She told me that she was basically trouncing men. I mean, boys. Yeah, she was strong. She said she was strong. She was beating her boyfriend, she said. So I was like, yeah, she's smoking marijuana as well. Yeah. Um, but, 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 Nothing really distinct that came out of this impact or fascination or um, fascination with the American westerns, American films, Hollywood films that was specifically for girls that I could see in my research in Kinshasa. I think Jamie, that's also part of, because of the way the the the, whole, the the gender the 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 gender dynamic also in the colonial city. You know, I mean, girls were had no mobility. You know, they they had no mobility. Uh, uh, boys, men had mobility. They could be seen. They could occupy public spaces and so on. And as a matter of fact. As I was talking about how parents were so grateful to the Grand Ville because the Grand Ville actually prevented the girls within the township from wandering outside. And this is also what parents wanted. This is also what the missionaries wanted. They didn't want the girls to go outside. They wanted to stay within the domestic sphere. So this is something where you see all the different people agree on that specific thing, which is to keep the girls bound, territory bound, township bound. Uh, thank you so much, thank uh, you. Prof. Uh, my question sort of harkens back to part of what uh, what uh, Dave was referring to, which is, and especially since you said they were uh, the bills that are being co-opted into the government because uh, Mobutu possibly saw them as a threat, I was wondering if there was ever any organization around uh, their discontents with uh, 
with colonial rule then, you know, as uh, if they were ever agitating in that, because, you know, I get the, the whole sort of commandeering nightclubs and this more yeah. area space. But was there ever an, an, uh, any sort of organizing or any agitating against against colonial rule, be, even be, in their small ways? Before 1960? Yes. Oh, okay. That's a very good question. Well, w what I'm really showing with the example of the bills is that uh, it's a sort of performative resistance. It's a way to use popular culture to resist the status quo, to resist domination, because you know that you cannot use other means, especially not other uh, overt means to uh, show your discontent, your dissatisfaction with the colonial regime because it's a regime that really tightly controlled the lives of, uh, of the natives, of the colonial subjects. Mm -hmm. So, but you still want to resist because that's part of the human impulse, you know, to resist oppression, you know, but how can you resist oppression when all the, uh, the avenues you know, are actually close to you. You know, you cannot, or, you talk about, you talked about organization. You cannot formally organize. You cannot have a political party. You cannot have trade unions. Um, you, you can't, you can organize. So you, you, you do organize, but in a very informal way. And you use the only avenue that you really have left, which is popular culture. That's why popular culture is so important. You know, it has been neglected by scholars for a very long time. And I'm just really glad that, that you know, Laura and me and other people and Jamie, we've, we've used popular culture. We've, 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 we've looked at popular culture as an instrument, a tool, a, uh, a battleground, you know, a space of, of, of resistance, of, of a space not just of creativity, but also a space of resistance. So no um, formal organization before 1960 to combat or to kind of fight the colonial system in Kinshasa. Yeah. Thank you so much um, Thank for you. this wonderful talk. Could we give uh, Professor Thank you very a much. hand of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.